At this time, I'm uh, delighted to uh, present our keynote speaker, Reverend Brian Souter, um, who's going to um, share with us his theme topic today, Humans Are Nature, Connecting Climate Change, Racism, and the Pandemic. Reverend Brian Souter is the President and Executive Director of Faith in Place. Through Reverend Souter's leadership, Faith in Place is exponentially growing the impact of their mission to empower people of all faiths across Illinois to be leaders for cleaner environments and healthier communities. Reverend Souter's passion is empowering faith communities to take measurable steps to connect the dots between faith, environmental justice, poverty, mass incarceration, race, violence, class, and health. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Brian Souter. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Interfaith Green Network, uh, to all the organizers of this event, to each of you who volunteer your time, to the amazing other organizations that are with us this morning. Shout out to all of you. Um, your work as people rooted in your faith to repair the earth is inspirational to me and inspirational to the Faith in Place Network. So buckle up, here we go, uh, connecting climate change, racism, and the pandemic. Talk about a challenge, right? It's 8 a.m. in the morning, here we are, we're ready to go for this. Um, so let me just tell you up front, I am gonna give you a, a, a overview of if humans are nature, if each of our bodies are nature, pause for a second, maybe just put your hand on your heart or um, you know, fold your hands together and think about your body is nature. Then repairing your relationship with your own body is a starting place for repairing our relationship with Mother Earth. This is the theme and challenge that I'm going to be lifting up uh, this morning. That repairing your relationship with your own body is a starting place and a signal of your own relationship with Mother Earth. It is from this foundation that I hope to build with you a conversation, a dialogue of how we connect the dots between three major crises facing us, climate change, racism, and the pandemic. Before we get there, I'm gonna give you a little overview. We had a big green team summit. Uh, I wanna to talk to you about that, that I dived into those topics, tell you how to access those recordings. Then we're gonna go through and define justice together. What is this notion of justice how does that inform the history of environmental justice in this country? And then continuing to work forward, connecting the dots personally. I hope to end the talk sharing a little bit vulnerably about my own experience in connecting these dots with my own body and that my body is nature and my relationship with my body is a signal to the relationship that we collectively have with Mother Earth. So before we begin and start to unpack this big topic, I invite you to pause for a second. I invite you to, on the Zoom room, as you come on in, as you welcome yourself again, maybe uh, sit up straight, maybe find your feet on the ground. Take a moment to pause and feel the ground with your toes. I even invite you to wiggle your toes if you want. Breathe, feel the breath in your belly. Just take a moment this Thursday morning to notice the many distractions around you. Welcome them. Observe them, pause. We are here together this morning and in this place. Even in this Zoom room, reach out with your energy and feel the connection of one another. The ways you accept yourself now in this moment is core to the way that you understand justice. Notice any tension in your body what is the wisdom of your body trying to teach you? I invite you to continue to observe one another, to relax. We are here to connect to one another this morning as a community of people of faith and conscience. This theme of climate change, racism, and the pandemic is something that we have Faith in Place explored at the Green Team Summit. And I'm getting used to doing public speaking here uh, on the Zoom room where I can, I can put in links into the chat at the same time while talking with you all. So I'm putting in a link to the greenteamsummit.org. This is an amazing gathering of people of faith and conscious. I know many of you were, were participating. In fact, 
over 1,100 unique individuals participated in at least one workshop representing 49 different states and 29 different countries came together to dive deep into this theme of climate change, racism, and the pandemic. Here's what was unique about it. As you go there, you can access the recordings. You will find a vibe, an energy of people of faith that feels audaciously celebratory as they take on very serious issues of climate change, racism, and the pandemic. DJ Antonio Caesar at the Green Team Summit opened each of the workshops with local environmental tunes, music that youth had recorded to get us ready and presence on the Zoom room to take on these challenges. Workshop speakers dove deep into specific topics from COVID-19 to flooding in the community, to telling our own stories, to climate communications, to connecting the dots. So I invite you to go check that out as a follow-up uh, to this conversation if you have yet to see um, the Green Team Summit or experience the Green Team Summit. These are fantastic quality content that will take this topic even deeper into particular areas. But my goal today with this morning, with this, this mature group that I, I am um, you know, just excited to talk with, to take a little bit more theologically to a, a foundational understanding. Because before we understand connecting the dots, we must understand first a common definition of justice. And before we understand environmental justice, we must consider what does it mean to be a person of faith who pursues justice, justice, justice. Take a moment, grab a pen. I would invite you to write down what is your definition of justice? Think about it for a second. We here in America talk and throw the term justice around over and over. What is your understanding of justice? Now there's of course many, not one single story, right? With the definition of justice. But as a Mennonite preacher, I'm someone who turns to the biblical scripture for guidance. And it's helpful and practical for me to think about justice in terms of mutual relationship across three areas mutual relationship across the areas. In other words, justice is mutuality and relationship with God, with neighbor and self. God, neighbor and self. When I'm not in mutual relationship, I'm usually either believing or acting in what ways? Inferior or superior? I don't know if anybody's had any experience in the last week, the last night, the last month of ever acting or believing or having a thought that was a thought of inferiority or superiority, but maybe I'm the only one here. But when was the last time that you thought about that? Maybe you thought that person is better than me. Or maybe you thought that person needs to get their act together. Or perhaps those people need to leave my community. Or to consider it further, those people are not worthy of what I have. Or those people are less than human. Notice I'm not talking about disagreeing with ideas or that idea as proclaimed by this person, but rather inferiority and superiority with my neighbor is declaring their very being as too much or not enough. And we must be honest with ourselves that when we reclaim another person as less than or too much, it is born of a lack of love and self-kindness to ourself. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you view yourself as inferior or superior, then the oppression of yourself will lead to the oppression of your neighbor. I think maybe you missed it. Let me say that again. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you view yourself as inferior or superior, then oppression of yourself will lead to oppression of your neighbor. RuPaul quotes Jesus and says, if you can't love yourself, how the heck are you gonna love somebody else? A quick overview of neighborliness throughout scripture from Genesis to Exodus to the land-based ethic of a rural preacher by the name of Jesus, relationship with neighbor encompasses not only our relationship with each other, but with all species all of the land. Our spiritual tradition compels us towards a just relationship with all of the land that acknowledges and accepts our inferiority and superiority with the land and moves us to more mutuality in relationship with the land. 
And finally, our spiritual traditions, the wisdom of the ages that we bring as multi-faith community proclaims us as whole and complete as individuals, that we are indeed able to be in mutual relationship with God. And together we are on this divine journey. Justice in that relationship breaks through any notion of inferiority or superiority that we may hold with God and proclaims rather that we are loved and whole and complete with God in this abundant love. I will tell you that I personally find this pro proclamation of mutuality with God simultaneously the most challenging and the most healing. For when I lean into my belief that God and abundant love is available for me, my mind, for me, my body, my sexuality, my race, my gender, that God proclaims me regardless, whole and complete, and in mutuality with the divine. It is here that I ground my mutuality with my neighbor in the widest definition of the term and with all the land. It is here that I wake up to accepting all of me. So I want to offer to you that one way to think about justice is to think about mutual relationship between God, each other, our neighbor, the land, and ourselves. It is from this understanding of justice, we can then begin to formulate an understanding of environmental justice. Now I wanna give a quick history of environmental justice, the movement itself and the role of people of faith and conscience. And I'll say upfront, uh, despite doing an undergraduate degree in environmental studies at a big 10 institution, the University of Illinois, despite having two master's degrees, I didn't learn the history of environmental justice in school. Instead, we learned the history of the environmental movement through the lens of white men, Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, Otto Leopold, Al Gore, and more. But did you know that the environmental justice movement starts with black church women in the 1980s? Black church women in the 1980s in Warren County were sick and tired of toxic dumping in the communities. And for the sake of their health of their bodies and for the sake of their children, these women left the basement of the church and laid their bodies down on the road to prevent the trucks from coming into their communities. These women sparked a movement that captured the imagination and attention of civil rights leaders in the 1980s and began to spark the first environmental justice conference. And it was in this movement of focusing on justice that the United Church of Christ commissioned a report on pollution and began to look at the correlating factors of where pollution resides in our communities. And as they looked at the hundreds of different correlating factors they recognized that at the top was the correlating factor of race, that if you were a community of color, you would have a toxic waste pollution dump site in your community. And this is where the beginning and the first coining of the term environmental racism was first expressed in the literature. Environmental racism is a term coined by people of faith grappling with the reality of where pollution resides. The coining of the term environmental racism, injustice, are defining communities of color as inferior. Notice this lack of mutuality. Inferior through policies that place toxic waste and disproportionate amounts of pollution, air, land, and water in communities of color. This is the history of our environmental justice movement in this country, led by people of faith and conscience, focused on that humans are nature, that our treatment of humans is the same treatment of Mother Earth and of nature. I just want to add here in this exploration in the movement of environmental justice, recently Dinah Gilio Whittaker, she wrote the book, As Long As the Grass Grows, states for native people, it's not just about racial privilege, we have to talk about the larger systems of oppression. And as people of faith and conscience, we can pick that up because we're talking about mutuality as the counter narrative to oppression, oppression with ourselves, oppression of neighbor, oppression of the land, oppression of creation. These larger systems of oppression define an environmental justice movement that is much larger 
than our original notions of an environmental movement. So I hope you're going with me. Feel free to stretch. We have gone some territory. We are exploring together a foundational understanding of justice. Continue to wiggle your toes, feel the ground beneath you. You can give me a wave and a smile. I have you on gallery view so I can see you all, that you're still with me and you're coming along here. Mutual relationship between God, neighbor, and land and self is what informs an understanding of environmental justice and environmental racism. And it's with that understanding, we have a framework, a shared language to think about our theme today, connecting the dots between climate change, racism, and the pandemic. At the Green Team Summit, Reverend Moss proclaimed at the very beginning, COVID-19 is rooted in COVID-1619, the date when the first slaves were brought over to this country on, on ships. But these systems of oppressions also have roots in COVID-1492, the date when Christopher Columbus came to this country and we began to systematically exclude and oppress the native people on the land. 18 years ago, I entered college to study environmental sciences. And this question that has haunted me in the pursuit of solutions to environmental degradation is why do we as humans harm the earth that supports our very life? Why do we as humans do this? Why do we harm the earth that supports our various life? Why is it a struggle to convince our neighbors and ourselves to not use plastic bags, to compost, to pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act? Am I the only one that asks this question? Why is this so hard? But notice in the act of that question, so much of our environmental activism and our movement blames others for this harm. But when we reorient to this faith-based understanding of justice, we can accept that all of us have a journey of harming ourselves. It is the oppression we commit to ourselves, the self-criticism tapes that we play in telling ourselves that we're either superior or inferior. The injustice of our relationship with ourselves actually does inform our relationship with our neighbor and land and each other. Our own relationship with our bodies, often unconscious, this is the same harm, the shame, the guilt, that unconscious self-harm is the same unconscious harm that we commit to brown bodies, black bodies, queer bodies, and yes, the body of Mother Earth. As humans, we are nature. My body is nature, and how I treat my body is me treating nature. If I'm self-critical, then I am harming nature. There's this old notion in the environmental movement that all we need to do is get more people involved. But if there's anything that we've learned in this movement is that getting more people on the streets doesn't lead to the change that we wanna see. The new notion that we're lifting up is a notion of striving for mutuality. It's a notion of building community that so proclaims a, a movement towards mutuality between God, our neighbor, the land and self that we build a resilience that welcomes and is inclusive. This is why anti-racism trainings often fail. Anti-racism trainings are so difficult and confronting that unless you have the tools to take and apply it to yourself, the way that your own oppression shows up in your own body and to begin to release that trauma, the anti-racism simply becomes information that unfortunately often white liberals use to weaponize and advance their own systemic oppression and to show their own superiority. This is very difficult. The same could be said about our environmental education efforts. Over and over, sociological studies show that the more education about climate change, more education about environmental degradation, isn't actually what changes people's minds about these topics. And so we become a chorus of amens. We become in our own little bubble, sharing with one another over and over the same information, convincing ourselves that we have the superior solution and that if only other people would listen to us, then we would create the world we wanna see. What we're talking about from a lens of justice though is taking individual responsibility for the ways that we oppress ourselves and drawing from our spiritual wisdoms to unleash and liberate ourselves as we seek to liberate others from the lens and framework of mutuality. This is a deep mutual relationship, relationship with self, neighbor, and all the land, and undoing the systems of opp oppression. 
Here's the good news. Our religious traditions provides millennia of wisdom of how to grow in mutual relationship. And so if we've forgotten that as our faith communities, we can go back to that and tap that wisdom. It is here that we bring the best of our knowledge to each other. Now, this is where it gets a little scary, is that when we begin to admit to ourselves that the self-harm we commit in silence with ourselves also manifest in our institution, that we as leaders, our churches, leaders of our businesses, leaders of our governmental agencies, our own relationship with ourself, the self-criticism, the shame, the guilt, the self-harm that we oppress ourselves with often unconsciously shows up in our policies and in our business practices and in our church worship services. This is where the real work of mutuality and responsibility begins. That this institutions that we create often unconsciously spread and magnifies what we create around us. And this is why justice is informed first by a mutual relationship that proclaims each of us as whole and complete along with God and with ourselves. And it is that righteous or mutual relationship that brings us into harmony with all of the land, all of the species and each other. And it's from this lens, we can see clearly ourselves in mutuality with the individuals and corporations that are causing the most harm. We see the harm in ourselves. So we understand the harm to the earth that's being committed. It is here from a place of mutuality, not inferiority or superiority that we can provide healing from that place of a justice-based relational mutuality. Now, these concepts can be kind of heady and, and theoretical, but we want to make them practical. And so at the risk of being overly practical, I do wanna share with you how I've seen this up in my own journey. And I share my own journey to invite you as you journal and think about this talk to journal in your own ways that perhaps how has your own self-harm, self-criticism, shame and guilt showed up in your relationships around you? And how can you take further responsibility drawing from the abundance of wisdom or religion to become more conscious? Maybe you're like me and you've participated recently in an anti-racism training where you found it so confronting and all of a sudden you felt the, the blinds of privilege fall from your eyes and you began to see yourself and your relationship with others in new ways. This is the sort of journey we're talking about, increasing our consciousness, our self-awareness, so that our environmental activism is informed from a place of liberating oppression. When I became executive director of Faith in Place six years ago, I was largely unconscious to my perfectionism. I grew up as a child uh, down in central Illinois in the rural country, and much of my system, my church system, my family system, was wrapped up in looking good and making sure that you did the right thing and that you were stated before the community as a good and hardworking boy, individual, man, woman, you named it. When I became the executive director of Faith in Place, I was thrown in, this, in a challenging leadership situation, 30 years old, moving to the city of Chicago for the first time, working with an amazingly talented staff team. But what I noticed later in reflecting back is that my perfectionism was showing up unconsciously in the way I went about my work. If I didn't see my staff doing the job to the unrelenting standard that I held necessary in order for me to be okay, do you hear that? In order for me to prove myself worthy, in order for me to be declared by the community as an okay person, then I would do the job myself enabling the staff team around me, working myself to exhaustive hours to the point of burnout. And as, as consciousness began to rise in myself to realize, oh, my formation as a little boy, wanting to prove myself worthy as belonging with my brothers, as belonging with my church community, was actually a formation rooted in inferiority and rather to proclaim that I am okay regardless of the work that is done, that I am proclaimed love regardless of my doing, that I, there it is from a place of rest that I could partner with my staff team, from a place of mutuality to meet them where they were at and together to share the load with joy and thanksgiving. It is there that the burnout themes shed away and rather the themes of being with one another lifted up in a new sense of mutuality. 
this is just one small example, but I hope that that inspires in you and own your own example in your own life of a way that your own formation, your own relationship with yourself can be magnified to the people around you and the institutions where you lead. So as we learn to further accept ourselves, accessing the wisdom of our religious traditions to help us to do so, as we heal that relationship with ourselves, bringing ourselves into further mutuality with ourselves, it is from that place that we can learn to accept further and live in harmony with brown and black bodies, with queer bodies, and with the body of Mother Earth. We can learn to accept and learn to live further in harmony with the land around us and accept further the spiritual truth that one in mutual relationship with each other is a mutual relationship with the divine. And it's from that standpoint and understanding that we can begin to see our individual participation in the crises that we, fit, we, we face today. That it is our individual relationship with our body as a collective whole that manifests in the systemic impressions around us that leads to COVID-19 and the public health disparities that we face, that leads to the racism that's manifested in our institutions and in our individual lives, that leads to the very actions of harming the earth that supports the very life that we are on. It is from there that we can each take further responsibility for ourselves and to live into a further theme of mutuality. And it is from there that we can rework our environmental actions to be born not of superiority or inferiority, but rather from a deep religious spiritual grounding and mutuality of relationship with ourselves, our neighbor, and with each other. This to me is our collective spiritual journey. As we grow in acceptance, we see ourselves more clearly and set aside the urgent need to prove ourselves through exploiting the earth and each other in the name of money and large corporations. But rather we settle into mutuality of community that is enjoyable and the foundations of our justice and peacemaking efforts. I leave you with this thought. This is where I call us to go as people of faith and conscience. As an interfaith green network, this is an opportunity to build such a radiating community of abundant love, of self-acceptance with yourself and with each other, that it so radiates and illuminates that people can't help to be attracted to it and begin to do their own personal work of the ways that self-criticism and harm show up and begin to heal their institutions as their institutions begin to recognize the ways they're not only harming the mother earth through climate change and environmental degradation, but harming the systemic racism that takes place in our communities and also advances the public health crisis that we have around COVID-19. This is my prayer. Thank you so much for having me this morning. May it be so. Wow. Brian, that was amazing. Thank you so, so much for sharing your thoughts. I can see the applause coming in from our audience. And uh, I just, um, I'm overwhelmed and um, I feel empowered to um, do more um, internal reflection. And um, I just, I don't know why it never occurred to me. And the way that you put it uh, is just, you know, it's really something that we can all um, take on and begin right here. And so I feel like this is a great starting point for us. And um, I uh, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. So I'm, I'm getting shivers, I'm invigorated. And um, now I would like to um, uh, bottle that and um, take, take you each into a breakout room so that we can kind of um, discuss what we've heard today and um, talk about some key takeaways and maybe um, think about what are some things that we can do to move forward with our community and all the work we need to continue to do. So um, Samantha,